Hello. I want to welcome everyone to our session today at the Horasis uh, USA meeting. Uh, the today's session is called Resolving Bipartisan Log Jams in the U.S. Um, my name is Gary Phillips. I'm going to be the chair, the moderator for today's session. Uh, on the session today, you see uh, Mahesh Kotecha, who is the president of Structured Credit International Corporation. We're also scheduled to have uh, the secretary, Elaine Marshall, who's the secretary of state in the state of North Carolina, is also scheduled to join us. Um, I hope that she would be able to join um, as the session uh, goes on. Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to just provide a short introduction to the topic, then um, introduce uh, Mr. Kotecha, and then we will proceed into discussing this very relevant topic. So the setup for the, for the conversation is the following. In democracies, an opposition party's role is to offer a strong discussion against government changes not to negate and delay every proposal, as seems to have been the case in the United States. So some of the questions that are relevant to this uh, headline are the following. What has gone wrong and right with government in the U.S.? How may beneficial changes to the U.S. government's remit be managed? And does the U.S. populace even care? Mm -hmm. Now, there are a lot of uh, topics that, uh, that are completely relevant uh, to this broad headline. Um, as I said, my name is Gary Phillips. I'm president and CEO of Orphamed. It's a development stage biotechnology company. I'll just introduce myself a little bit in that I started my career as a, a practicing general medicine physician and then transitioned into the pharmaceutical and biotechnology industry. Now, this doesn't make necessarily my background relevant to this topic, but I did for a period of time serve as the head of health and healthcare at the World Economic Forum, uh, which is committed to improving the state of the world through creating cross-societal collaboration to improve our policy topics. And so during the time of, at the forum, I worked on a number of topics that were to advance human health by fostering collaboration across both parties, but also across uh, segments of society. The, when I was asked to chair the session, there were a lot of the topic where around log jams its effect on the U.S. was in response to COVID and how bipartisan log jams may have prevented a coordinated response, which ultimately led to the highest rate of infection in the world and also the largest number of deaths with near, nearly a million people having died mm -hmm. uh, from COVID-19 uh, since the onset of the pandemic. We won't necessarily talk about that topic specifically, although we may get on that. Um, but what I want to start with is introducing uh, Mr. Kotecha. As I said, uh, Mahesh Kotecha is the president of Structured uh, Credit International Corporation, which provides financial advisory service on ratings and capital markets for emerging markets and other clients. Uh, prior to forming SCIC, Mr. Kotecha has a long tenure in many financial services firms. He is expert in sovereign and other credit ratings. He will begin, in addition to pro providing any additional background, because his, his resume is quite long and impressive, he'll be, begin by providing some insights into how log jams have affected the U.S. government's ability to fi finance its debt in the capital markets. So let me turn over to Mr. Kotecha. My hope is that, as I said, Secretary Marshall will join us as well. We'll make an introduction of her and get her introductory comments when she joins. So, Mr. Patejo. Thank you very much, Gary, for the introduction and of the topic and of uh, my background. Um, uh, it's a very relevant topic today. Um, uh, we, we have a moment uh, of unity in the country uh, in the current uh, geopolitical situation, but uh, uh, below the surface, there are uh, continuing differences of views, and uh, we have uh, um, seen the impact of these differences in the capital markets, which is what I want to talk about. Um, uh, when I think about the U.S. political strife, and I'm not a political analyst as much as a financial analyst, um, and, but I have looked at issues of national, political, um, 
willingness to pay and ability to pay debts on time, which are what ratings are about, sovereign ratings. And actually, I was responsible for U.S. government rating when I was at S&P uh, in the rating days that I was there, which was from 79 to 87. Uh, the credit rating downgrade of uh, U.S. Uh, took place much later uh, in 2011. But I remember that uh, I had to dash over to uh, have meetings uh, with the Fannie and Freddie um, uh, U.S. government agencies in Washington when people were threatening downgrades. They were threatening defaults even then. Um, so a little background on, on the debt ceiling, and then I'll go into 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 the uh, logjam and how it was resolved there. Uh, U.S. political uh, gridlock was a reason for S&P's rating downgrade uh, of the U.S. government's AAA rating to AA plus in 2011, having placed it on negative outlook in early 2011, some months or prior. The causes of the gridlock that led to the uh, debt ceiling crisis then and other similar log jams we have had are uh, they run deep. Uh, there is gerrymandering, uh, which is a U.S. term on how uh, the electoral uh, map is uh, engineered to uh, suit the uh, party uh, that wants to ensure its victory. Um, both parties do it. It's been done to extremes, in my opinion. Second, there is the decline of U.S. manufacturing sector blamed for pol by politicians uh, on cheap imports from China and better explained, according to some, by uh, automation. Um, and third, there is the pondering to uh, fear uh, in white America that is losing ground, that it is losing ground to other colors. Um, perhaps there are other causes, uh, but these false lines in the body politic are not easy to repair and will take a long time to cure. Uh, the experience of the debt ceiling, though, <clears throat> may give us a little hope. A little background on the debt ceiling. It dates back to, 27, to 1917, uh, when the U.S., uh, before that, it had no debt ceiling. Um, uh, it has uh, instituted that in, uh, in the Liberty, Second Liberty Bond Act of 1917. And uh, uh, Dick, Dick Gephardt, uh, actually, in 1979, noting how difficult it was to get past these resolutions of the debt ceiling, proposed a Gephardt rule, which was a parliamentary rule that did, deemed the, that the debt ceiling was automatically raised when the budget was approved. Oddly, we don't have that anymore. The debt Gephardt rule was, was eliminated uh, some years back. It was repealed by the Congress in 1995, so it stood about 15, uh, about 15 years. But today we have uh, the, the debt ceiling debate, and most recently last, uh, last fall. Um, so let us first see why the downgrade took place in 2011 and whether it could happen again in this acidic uh, gridlock. Janet Yellen wrote uh, a Wall Street Journal article an op-ed on September 19 last year in the run-up to the uh, debt ceiling uh, debate that, quote, Congress has raised and suspended the country's debt ceiling about 80 times since 1960. And remember, there were more because it was this was in 1917 that right. the debt ceiling went in. Now it must do so again, she said. If not, sometime in October, that's last October, it is impossible to pick precisely when, the Treasury Department's cash balance will fall to an insufficient level and the federal government will be unable to pay its bills, unquote. Using the Congress, urging the Congress to act swiftly, uh, she warned that in 2011, when the debt limit brings a brinkship, a brinkmanship pushed America into the edge of a crisis, quote, America's credit rating was downgraded and there was a, there was a severe stock market downturn, 2000 on a 1,500, 15,000 point level uh, stock exchange level, so over 10%. This led to financial market disruptions that persisted for months. Yes. So in 2011, the threat of default led S&P formally uh, to, to downgrade uh, the country's credit rating 
and writing on this downgrade of the U.S. from AAA to AA plus on August 5, S&P warned. And I happen to know the analysts who did this, uh, communicated with him on this uh, discussion. Quote, S&P said, the outlook on the long-term rating is negative. That is, not only did they downgrade, but they said it could down, go down right. further. Right. We could lower the long-term rating to AA. They haven't done so yet. If we see the conditions, if we see higher interest rates, which are coming, or new fiscal pressures during this period, which have been, of course, rife, and uh, such that they result in higher general government debt, which of course has happened. All conditions they talked about have been met. Right. Okay. But the downgrade has not happened yet. SNP projected in 2011 that net general government debt would rise from an estimated 74% of GDP by the end of 2011 to 79% in 2015 and 85 in 2021. Moody's in the had on by, for its own part on August 2, shortly um, before the SNP action, placed the AAA its AAA ratings on 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 a negative outlook for the U.S. It stated then that it expected U.S. federal government's debt to GDP ratio. Uh, to be not too far above the projected 2012 level of 73% by the middle of the decade, followed by a decline. A decade later, to the, nearly a, de a decade later, nearly uh, uh, Moody's notes in its December 2, 21 report, just a couple of months back, right. uh, on U.S. that general government debt has risen not to what they said, which was around mid 70s, and actually declined, but 115%. Okay, in 2020, which is above what S&P expected uh, in 2011. Uh, instead of falling, U.S. debt has doubled from $15.2 trillion at the end of 2011 to over $30 trillion currently. Indeed, the IMF projects that U.S. general government debt will stabilize at just over 130% of GDP, 130% of GDP. That's nearly double what it was as a percent of GDP from 2011. Uh, the third highest level in the G7 after Japan and Italy, uh, according to uh, an article by John Chambers, uh, the one who downgraded the mm -hmm. U.S. was the chairman of the downgrade of the rating committee, although downgrade is a committee decision uh, at S&P. Uh, he's now a professor at NYU. So is a second rating downgrade about to happen? Perhaps. Uh, and that was the threat Janet Yellen warned about. Um, the fiscal balance is worse than S&P thought then. The risk reserve status of the dollar is more at risk. And this current crisis leads to greater de uh, uh, de role for the yuan to circumvent U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, and other Western uh, sanctions against Russia. <clears throat> and the politics are still fraught uh, and the debt ceiling remains a hard constraint. But the Congress decided in mid-21, after some rounds of uh, uh, kicking down the can, uh, prompted no doubt by Janet Yellen's warning, uh, to raise the debt ceiling by $2.5 trillion uh, 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 to put off the day of reckoning until after the November 22 elections. Now, this happened in an interesting way where Senate uh Majority lead, the minority leader, uh, McConnell and Schumer decided to, uh, on a, on, on a parliamentary technique that allowed the Democrats to actually vote the increase in the debt ceiling without any Republican vote and without mm -hmm. the 60, uh, uh, vote, uh, veto, uh, sort of, uh, in the Senate. So it was an interesting compromise that they agreed on because some sense was drilled into even the Republican uh, Senate, uh, who uh, allowed this uh, disaster to to not happen. So it, uh, to me, that gives some hope that when push comes to shove, sometimes we can actually get through the gridlock, even though we don't want to show that we did. But that was, to me, a success. Uh, so let me stop there, and I'd be happy to come back to any of the issues that people might have on it. Yeah, I mean, th thank you for those opening comments. I think there were so many nuggets in there. Uh, first of all, it's surprising to me that it's been 11 years since the downgrade happened. It doesn't seem like it was that many years ago. Second, I think it was pretty uh, pre prescient that uh, there was a contemplation that we such a rise in the, in the debt, you know, from that point, 
However, as you noted, it dropped and then climbed. And we understand a number of the factors that drove that. So they, 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 I guess, foresaw that there would be uh, an increase in the debt, but they didn't understand how that was going to happen. Nor yeah. I don't think any of us could have done so. so. I think there's some really nice comments in there. I see that we have someone from Secretary Marshall's uh, um, team who's joined us. So if you could just introduce yourself. And then I have a specific question uh, for you, you know, with regard to, to North Carolina in response to Mr. Kovic's opening remarks. Sure. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Secretary Marshall uh, apologizes. She tried to sign in multiple times this morning and got the dreaded spinning wheel for some reason. Oh, my. Um, so I'm happy to join uh, on her behalf this morning. Thank you to Dr. Richter for the invitation and for, for hosting us uh, this morning. Um, one thing to note, uh, as we are in Women's History Month, is the secretary is very uh, honored to be the first elected statewide woman in North Carolina history uh, to the Secretary of State's office. So it's, it, it's humbling uh, for her that she gets to be on, on the, the date lines of history in North Carolina. Uh, but uh, a couple of points that I think are useful for um, this conversation is that she began her career as a school teacher. Um, she also was a small business owner and entrepreneur, um, and now is uh, a, a practicing attorney as a, in, uh, in addition to being a statewide uh, public official. She also served in the North Carolina State Senate, so certainly had to broker um, conversations across aisle uh, from that perspective as well. Uh, Couple of key points that I think she would uh, want to discuss or that we would like to discuss kind of as part of this conversation and in, in bipartisanship is um, she is part of a, a, a global coalition here in North Carolina as a, as a co-chair. And when they asked her to be the chair, she, she was asked to be the solo chair of the committee. And she was pretty adamant that to make things work in North Carolina, especially with the current makeup of our body politic, that there had to be bipartisanship. And so she asked a Republican co-chair to join her for that um, committee. And the work has gone on pretty ex uh, extensively. Some of the goals are around education, global competitiveness, um, food insecurity. So certainly things that aren't necessarily partisan issues. But one thing she is adamant about is, is it's not just bipartisanship that we're after, it's a diversity of opinions and voices in the room, which aren't necessarily just a Republican versus Democrat um, issue. Um, so certainly uh, willing and uh, look forward to fleshing out some of uh, her accomplishments and some of the uh, items that we have uh, worked on over the last uh, few years. One thing also of note is she is also co-chair of the North Carolina Moldova Bi uh, bipartisan or not bipartisan, but, uh, lateral bilateral partnership, mm -hmm. which has been longstanding since 1999. And that agreement is signed every five years uh, by um, governors of North Carolina and have been signed by uh, governors of both parties. So certainly a bipartisan um, effort um, in that regard. And, and that partnership has been fruitful in terms of offering humanitarian assistance to Moldova, which we know is under, you know, intense pressure right now, um, not only in, in terms of threat from, uh, from Russia, but also a, a mass refugee um, issue right now into Moldova that we're trying to um, help navigate some humanitarian, some fundraising efforts around. So, be glad to um, uh, join in this discussion today. Yeah, well, thank you for those opening comments. And I was, and I appreciate your having provided those uh, back, background remarks. But I was going to, to comment similarly the, the fact that the secretary was the first woman elected uh, to a statewide office in North Carolina. The other thing that's interesting from her background um, is the fact that she's been secretary of state for 25 years. And so if, if there's anyone who's had a front row seat to this evolving say, by bipartisan logjam or say, you know, partisanship, um, she has had it, you know, at the state level, but obviously state level having uh, a lot of visibility into the, the federal level as well. Now, you know, when in, in having conversation or let's say back and forth correspondence with her prior to this discussion, uh, she was proud of the fact that North Carolina had been able to put some things in place 
that was able to preserve the credit rating of the state of North Carolina that perhaps is, could be a model for the federal government and, and to Mr. Kotech's point of view uh, around you know, the background on the downgrade in 2011. So if you could just talk about some of the things that North Carolina has been able to do. I think you, you touched on the fact that she serves as a co-chair in a bipartisan way you know, with regard to a number of initiatives, but how have they been able to preserve their credit rating? How have they been able to uh, get some movement across the log jam? Well, I think it, it, uh, most of that work comes from her efforts on what's called the Local Government Commission here in um, North Carolina, and they work with local governments on making sure that they are um, well-financed, doing things the right way. Um, and this body is made up of a bipartisan group of people. It's chaired by a Republican treasurer. And so I think they um, certainly make very concerted efforts to help these state governments or, or local governments um, do things the right way, stay afloat, make sure that their finances are in um, good order. And I think that has helped this state uh, maintain its its bond rating effectively and that they work um, closely with these um, local governments to make sure that they do things the right way. Right. Okay. So in some ways, there's this interplay between the local governments and the state government that kind of bubbles up in some ways. It'd be interesting to see if the federal government could see some bubbling up of some statewide initiatives to its level to, to help with that. But you now I want to go back to, to Mahesh and, and just ask a question you know, from his point of view. If we look at, you know, as we start off this conversation, I talked a bit about how as a as someone who's been involved in health care and health policy all my life, looking at the, the failed collaboration uh, between parties within our society to fighting a common enemy. Um, and one would say that makes you pessimistic or make me pessimistic uh, that uh, this, that we could ever resolve these log jams and that we can ever um, you know, make progress that would get to some of the fundamental issues that you talked about in your credit, your credit downgrade. So what I'm interested in is how do you see our failed, what I would say, a failed response to COVID-19. In the past month, there are signs where you actually do have bipartisan collaboration. I think there are two elements of this. One would be obviously the, let's say the global, but really within the United States, this cross-party uh, collaboration in response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And then second would be, uh, you know, this just happened a couple of days ago, sort of some of the initial findings of the January 6th commission, which again, although it's contentious, the Republicans serving on that commission you know, in the House, uh, but, but they did come out with some at least preliminary thoughts around uh, uh, you know, culpability, um, and which again shows that you can get collaboration across parties. How do you see these kind of, uh, say, green shoots around ability to, to work across the aisle and potentially its effect on credit rating and you know financing in the U.S. So, you know, kind of the translation of some maybe some good signs early and how that might affect you know actions downstream. And you just have to turn off your mute. Yes, sorry, uh, sorry about that. I, I hope that uh, the 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 Ukraine uh, Russia uh, situation is a turning point, not only uh, uh, for the world, which it is, but also for our body politic. It's, a, we, we, it's not a foregone conclusion because if the threats recede, I don't see how they recede because they are in there and they are not going away. Then things could go back to where they were. But, but this is a, a system, a, a major system shock, as a pandemic has been. Um, um, and so uh, the the uh, impetus to come together against a common enemy, I think that seems to be a greater impetus than to come together against a common microbial enemy, because the microbial enemy is anonymous, uh, and, and and to 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 diagnose its uh, um, 
its impact takes other people. <laughs> and you can disagree with them, whereas here the threat is very evident uh, and it's uh, on television every day. Uh, That's very so, insightful. You're right. That, 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 that is a key difference. Uh, good point. So, so and I think that the uh, other thing is that we had, for some odd reason, um, cultural wars imposed on 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 viral uh, uh, issues. Uh, I just don't see how how this could have been a sensible thing to do with any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but this is the irrationality uh, of uh, of politics. Uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe the secretary and his uh, team would have a view that is uh, more insightful because they're more political than I have. <laughs> I think that certainly, I mean, really hits the mark. It's good insight. We've certainly seen a, politi- a, a, a hyper-partisan and a hyper-political around the pandemic. Um, and we've heard... Um, fringe voices kind of take control of the conversation um, where, um, which is similar to other kind of more policy type efforts. I think we were buoyed somewhat during the State of the Union address to see kind of this unification obviously around um, the attacks on Ukraine and our support for Ukraine and the refugees And there was certainly some unification around that issue. And maybe that will be um, a swing point or maybe that will be kind of a way to push the conversation the other way where we can start working together again across aisles and having meaningful dialogue and and conversation. And Secretary Marshall is certainly a forward thinker and a forward mover. But to some degree, I think, you know, we would like to see kind of the conversations and the respect level go back to where we were maybe a decade or two ago when we could have different opinions boisterously, but still work on solutions that were good for the citizens of our country, the citizens of North Carolina. Um, But I think, you know, I think you made a very good point around uh, common enemies um, and that the politicization of the pandemic (laughs) was certainly a different tone for this country. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm I'm generally uh, optimistic uh, on two counts. Uh, I studied physics and, and, uh, you know, in, 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 one thinks uh, in physics of forces that lead to movement um, and and forces tend to spend themselves through friction and through attrition. Uh, we have uh, had Trumpism, uh, which was the epitome of uh, uh, cacophony and and uh, and gridlock, uh, including shutdowns that were three under Trump, not on account of debt ceilings, but on account of just obstreperous uh, uh, demands on the on the on the funding for the uh, for the border wall um i think that uh, uh, trump is becoming uh, over time a spent force um especially if the select committee's findings uh stick uh, uh raise the specter for him of uh, criminal liability um um i just read in the press today about a a son and a father on the opposite sides of litigation regarding uh, January 6, where a, fa- a son turns in his his father uh, and 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 testifies for three hours against him. I think we are seeing a change in 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 the body politic that is slow. It takes time, um, and it takes an external shock to kind of uh, jiggle the system a bit, to provide a nudge, as uh, as uh, uh, some people would say. Um, I hope that it moves in the right direction. What is and Mitt Romney has come out and condemned uh, the action uh, of uh, praising uh, Putin uh, on the part of the former president. So I think there is. But what 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 is amazing is it, this, this the silence on the part of the leadership. Um, uh, actually, George Bush, George W. Bush, also condemned it fairly quickly. 
um, the Putin uh, action. So I think we're seeing some signs that that Trumpism uh, without Trump may be what survives, but Trump is not uh, going to be the force he once was, at least so I hope. Um, Did you have additional comments then to make? From, from I just had I just had one thing to add, Gary, kind of around the hyper partisanship issue, and I don't I I didn't quite catch the beginning of some of the comments, um, but I think another thing that has led to this massive gridlock issue is um, extreme gerrymandering efforts right. in yep. states, and North Carolina is kind of a perfect example of that. Um, we would be called a purple state by the pun. Exactly. Right? Well, it's going um, to make a reference to your purple state. <laughs> actually, yeah. We are, um, you know, <laughs> slightly more registered Democratic voters in North Carolina, not by a lot, over Republican. And unaffiliated voters are actually ahead of Republicans now and are about to overtake Democrat uh, registered Democrats in this state. They're only about 6,000 shy of wow. registered Democrats, so certainly a purple state by political punditry. But if you look at the makeup of our um, elected officials in North Carolina at the congressional level, we are a 10-3 split for Republicans. Um, the General Assembly is controlled by Republicans by a pr fairly wide margin, but our governor is a Democrat. And we have this tradition in North Carolina, largely, not in every election, but, but in most elections, of electing a Democrat for governor, but we select a Republican for president. So it's this really interesting state for political scientists um, to study, but kind of that hyper gerrymandering, extreme gerrymandering process once every 10 years, I think, has also led to this um, excessive backlog um, and gridlock that we see. I agree totally. And I, I mentioned that as uh, Gary knows, I think you, you in my opening uh, preamble. Uh, so, but I noticed that your state, uh, North Carolina is AAA uh, by two rating agencies. Uh, maybe Fitch was uh, at AAA, but went down, uh, um, it seems. Uh, so congratulations on that. <laughs> I would different. say it's been tri it's bipartisan AAA under Democratic <laughs> governors, under Republican governors, under Democratic general yeah. assemblies, under Republican general assemblies. So they've been at least able, both groups have been able to work together to ensure that the state maintains that AAA, which has really been important for our um, economic success. As most people might know that North Carolina is one of the top states to do business. Um, we're certainly seeing at the Secretary of State's office where we have business registration, uh, just a mass um, increase in the number of registered new businesses in our state by, you know, 40, 45 percent. Um, we've doubled over the last four years in the number of, um, of businesses that have registered with the Secretary of State's office. So I think that AAA bond rating is certainly part of maintaining that economic success for the state. And it's been you know, both parties have been able to maintain that, which is, I guess, maybe something to look to as an example. Yeah, for me, it's it's quite interesting because, again, you know, not being from the, specifically from the finance side or from the politics side of, of this conversation, but I did actually serve on the board of a company uh, that was headquartered in the RTP area. So, you know, frequently would go down to Raleigh Durham for board meetings and and did feel the purpleness of the state when I would go to visit I'm from Pennsylvania, which in its own way is a bit purple um, in, in terms of, you know, being a swing state and having this, you know, the two sides and the gerrymandering issue. Uh, but it's interesting when you have, seems to me then that part of the solution may be that there is a pragmatism in the leadership that says no matter who's in power, whether it be from a state assembly side, from a congressional side, from a presidential side, from a governor side. So, um, that we're going to work on behalf of the wealth, the, 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 the progress of the state and, and the ability to grow and develop as a state. And so they keep the focus on what is most important and therefore they're able to work through the gridlock. And I don't know if that may be part of the solution. And back to Mahesh's comments on 
<laughs> what's happened to our country. I think Trumpism as a symptom of what's happening in the country at, at a deeper level um, is interesting and whether Trumpism will ever go away because you know, the, the forces that caused him to rise to power, unfortunately, have not gone away in some instances. No, risen. no. So, ha- you know, these are some of my reactions to some of the comments that were just made. <laughs> I think that there's optimism when people keep their eye on the prize, they keep their eye on what matters and they work collaboratively. But then there are societal factors which are causing divides. So there are two different, a number of forces acting here, right? So Mahesh, I think you have some comments. I, I, I think that the fundamental uh, forces that, uh, that uh, have led to this kind of a discord, they are possible to resolve over time. It is not that they are not possible to resolve. It's just that the discourse has become uh, a diatribe um, and uh, become very discordant. Uh, um, it, it needlessly so. That goes back to, I think, the uh, Gingrich uh, doctrine uh, mm-hmm. of uh, not using policy uh you know, differences and discussion of policies, but to turn to personalities and to venom. And and the venomization of differences is really the issue. Differences are not the issue. Differences are possible to resolve uh, through compromise, through innovation, through resolution of uh, uh, differences, uh, through talking. But Venom is, 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 it just festers. And I think that's where the, we need to have respect for each other, uh, and, and, and respect for dialogue, uh, and for compromise. And that, that I think the style of Biden, although he, uh, has his own uh, issues, um, it's a more soothing style. I think we have to see if this time over time, things heal. Uh, I certainly hope so. Yeah. I think the one thing that I would add to that, we, whether we probably haven't thrown um, into the mix because it could probably be its own session, is the impact that social media exactly. has had on yeah. our political discussion. Exactly. And that, um, you know, you can use extreme language. You can be disrespectful as much as you want on social media. You can throw a lot of grenades and not have any accountability for it whatsoever. Um, But that kind of herd mentality also does affect, you know, somebody who is counting on votes um, to hold elected office. Um, And so it drives um, a little bit of some of their reaction sometimes. And so I think that's one thing that has been thrown uh, into this political mix over the last really only, what, 15 years or so? Right. Remarkably. Um, that we're still trying to understand and learn its impact and really how to negotiate that into a more uh, bipartisan discussion politically. You know, it's very interesting. I was listening to NPR uh, program on on internet interruptions. And uh, there are, uh, when there are elections, when there are demonstrations, many countries around the world, not the US uh, as much uh, or at all, uh, turn off the internet. And the biggest culprit is India. India had a hundred incidents, I think last year or uh, the year before. Um, So yes, I think this is, because of the fear that they have of exactly what uh, what uh, what we heard about uh, social media, um, and as you know, the uh, um, um, the U.S. government uh, is looking at uh, at the issue currently from the regulatory point of view. Um, yeah. So I think that's that's I mean I, I I would agree at least you know my observation that you know social media and the ability to select the conversations uh, that you participate in right whether that's through social media whether that's more through mass media and being able to this this whole um, echo chamber phenomenon seems to contribute to a bit of the divide in the country. I guess what I heard then from the secretary's office was that 
um, we're kind of early in the evolution of this social media, right? 15 years in, we may not have worked out all of the problems so that we can get the benefit without paying a lot of the price when it comes to divide and, and the log jam. And so that that it's, it's a good point that it's easy to say that what we're experiencing today is the most, um, you know, is, is I was just saying that, um, you know, I, I, I thought your point was good that social media has only been around for 15 years and that, uh, you know, maybe we're too early with regard to that platform to uh, be able to to understand exactly what the effects will be over the long run. And so I know we're in the final minutes of our, our session. I think we have about four minutes or so left. And so uh, I did want to give, uh, you know, Mahesh, your, you, you the opportunity and the Secretary's office the opportunity to, to make any concluding comments. So um, are there any other things that you had wanted to discuss today, uh, which will give you the, the final you know, few minutes to, to, to present to the group? Why don't uh, we let the secretary's office go first? Uh, okay, I was just saying that you know we're in the final few minutes of the session. Just wanted to see if there are any concluding comments that the secretary's office would like to make with regard to this topic. Sure. Sorry, I got disconnected a couple times there. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> uh, I think uh, just a couple things, and the secretary alluded this on a podcast uh, a kind of a week ago when it when she was asked the question about, you know, if you can make a magic wand to make things better, what would that be? And I think it would be um, to some degree, at least, you know, in North Carolina, we've experienced over the last decade where there's not as much what I would say social engagement or social connectivity between our elected officials kind of after they leave the, the chamber floors as there used to be maybe 10 or 20 years ago when there mm. used to be kind of these sessions or, you know, some groups would sponsor events and lawmakers would go to those kind of mm. um, outside of session and get to know their fellow elected officials in a different way, not just throwing kind of uh, grenades on the House and Senate right. floor against each other. They would actually get to know them, learn about their families, um, learn about them. And that makes it harder to have um, uh, difficult conversations in a disrespectful way. I think it makes it harder to criticize somebody in a disrespectful way. And I think if you could kind of wave, wave a magic wand, that would be one thing so that our elected officials kind of get to know kind of each other in a different way than just on uh, uh, a Republican, Democrat, um, House and Senate floor throwing venom, as you said, against each other. And that's much harder when you know somebody. Um, and I think that's one thing that the, the the secretary had alluded to in a recent podcast, that if she could make, wave her magic wand, that might help kind of get us back to to unlocking this bipartisan gridlock. Yeah. I, so, you know, connection on a human level, you know, at a personal level is really important. So that's Hesh, with a final with final minute, uh, well, the final comment. I, I agree with that uh, notion of personal engagement. Uh, it's much harder to um, to be nasty when you actually know the people on the other side and have respect for them. And I, I think we are seeing some of that return, perhaps, um, in the in the Congress. And I think we need to have greater engagement. Uh, at grassroots levels, uh, there are efforts underway to talk to your neighbor or talk to somebody on the other side. Uh, but it's very difficult. I, the, the, you know, uh, when people with different opinions get together and talk, they often become more convinced of their extremities, of, they become more extreme. <laughs> so we have to say uh, this is a continuing campaign for us, uh, something that we hope improves and we have to continue to work at it. Great. And I think the last thing we always have to end with, and, you know, because the three of us are sort of in a, a part of the demographic that may have, you know, we're in the, in the prime moving onward. And so we have to look to the next generation who Absolutely. think a lot differently, who have different, they've grown up with social media and other interconnectivity in a very different way. And we'll have to see, you know, as those who are sort of sitting, you know, praying for their success, I think uh, we have to look to them as hope as well. So with that, I want to thank uh, everyone for their participation and uh, those who've joined us um, from the audience and uh, wish all of you a good start to the day. 
Thank you very much. Thanks, Gary. Thank All you. Right, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.